Hello and welcome back to the Villa Filler podcast. I'm here as always with my good friend Dan Wiseman. Dan, Luton Town coming up, away trip, very excited about this one. But before we get into all of that, how are you doing? I'm very good, mate. I'm very good. It's been a nice week. Um, it's one where, you know, we've seen, I mean, this by actual still doesn't quite feel real, but I'm sure for everybody that's managed to secure tickets and everything like that, um, I'm incredibly jealous is probably the most important thing to say. But yeah, it's been nice. It's been good to see Esri back in training and everything like that. We've got some pretty wholesome content of him stepping up back on the grass and everything like that. And so, yeah, I think the world of an Aston Villa fan is a bright one right now, mate. I'm looking forward to tomorrow's game. Yeah, it feels like everything's sort of coming together almost at just the right time because... We've got such a difficult run in, as we mentioned in the last podcast, really, mate, with this Luton game. And then you look at Ajax away, Tottenham at home, Ajax away again. These four games are season defining games, realistically, aren't they, mate? This is a really important run in and it's going to be difficult to manage the load. But it's it's key that we sort of stick the land in with all four of these. Well, we've been saying it for a little while, mate, that. I mean, I know that it's kind of cliche when you get to this point of the season. Like, obviously, the games get more and more important as you go on. I think the it's important that particularly this game against Lucent because I think it probably marks... And honestly, no disrespect to Lucent intended whatsoever because, you know, they're a fantastic team and they've shown on more than one occasion this season they can really hold their own in the Premier League. I think it would be a fantastic story for the league. I think if they were to survive, obviously they won't have been done any favours with Everton's points reduction. I think that's the right word. <laughs> yeah, the end's reduced and then points <laughs> reattributed, whatever you want to call it. Everton getting four points back to their tally won't have helped them whatsoever because I think the top is probably where their main chance of survival and their punishments and everything like that. So they've got a bit of a job on their hand, but they do have a game in hand against Nottingham Forest. And so... I think the spirit within that club definitely makes it, you know, I think if we got to the end of the season, they had stayed, but I don't think anyone would have been too surprised and there certainly couldn't be anyone to say it's not been deserved. So, yeah, but at the same time, this probably represents our last chance of a more than likely three points. Probably some time, to be honest with you, you would have been kind of looking at this red of fixtures, knowing that a European game would come into the fold. I don't think any of us could have dreamt that it would have been Ajax but and whilst that's a dream tie it's certainly one that we're going to have our work about in so yeah and you look at this Luton game those two games against Ajax either side of that game against Spurs as you mentioned mate West Ham Wolves City Brentford Arsenal over a stretch that takes us through until late April and then you're really in crunch time so yeah I think between now we sit here on the 1st of March and the end of next month we'll probably have a really, really good idea of exactly where we're going to finish come the end of the season. But we play a lot of teams that we're in and around now, and so it'd be really interesting to see how we come out the other side of this, mate. But to go into that with a win against this game against Luton, I think is really, really important. Yeah, absolutely, mate. It it really is. And when you consider how big we've sort of managed to make that gap between United and Spurs, obviously the other team that are sort of hot on our tails and we have you know, we're in a good position next week to really give some daylight there as well. And you consider it's the Manchester Derby this weekend as well. So you would, you would, you know, I'm not a betting man, but I would probably put my money on Manchester City winning that one at home. Even though actually United do have a good record at the Etihad in the Derby in recent years, don't they? Uh, I think it dates back as far as the Mourinho days, really. Mourinho and Solskjaer, they got some big wins there. It felt like City couldn't win at all at home against them for a little while. But I sort of look at Luton, and as you say, mate, we shouldn't discount Luton. They have been the the shining light that nobody expected from the promoted sides. I, I find it kind of funny how the discourse has been around the promoted sides because, you know, at the start of the season, and, and, you know, we were guilty of it as well. If you go back and, and listen to our sort of season predictions, I think you and I both had Burnley, as everyone else did, doing the best out of the promoted sides I think we also probably gave Luton a bit more respect than a lot of teams uh, a lot of fans probably did give in their previews as well but Luton have been the most effective side and I find it funny because like, obviously all that chat was about Burnley they're not even in 
conversations anymore. They're not even in, you know, when you when you talk about who's got it, like it's a given Burnley are going down. It's almost a given Sheffield United are going down. And it is almost a shame for, for Luton that the points have been sort of rewarded back to Everton. Um, but then I guess you kind of have to remind yourself that they were only in that position because of a 10-point deduction. But there was a stat... Um, I'm not sure how true it is up to this point in the season, but I remember the last time we played Luton, we were the only side that they'd come up against. And I think that was like 10 or 12 games into the season where Luton had lost a game in the Premier League by more than one goal. Obviously, we beat them, was it 3-1 in the home game? And it was kind of mm-hmm. like we... Uh, I wasn't actually at that game, so I don't, re- I don't have a great recollection of it, if I'm being honest. But we... Um, I don't want to say blew them away, but by Luton standard, they've been very competitive and they've been in, you know, almost every game they've been in, which is almost sort of contradictory to their most recent result in the FA Cup where Man City sort of blow them away. And, you know, you can sort of put that down to, you know, to Kevin De Bruyne's back. They've got, De Bruyne and Haaland have a connection that I would like to liken to Leon Bailey and Ollie Watkins right now. They're just absolutely, you know, they just know where each other are all the time. And, you know, I think on any day, any team can go, do you know what? We lost that game because Kevin De Bruyne stepped foot on the football pitch and that's okay. Um, but I look at... We've been there. Yeah, we've absolutely made m- Many a time, many a time. He's an absolutely wonderful player, uh, even at his age. I say even at his age, you know, he's got sort of approaching 30 now, isn't he? Um I look at a lot of these goals that City scored, though, and, you know, there are, you know, a second goal, wonderful sort of 30-yard pass Haaland's running onto. That's his sort of speciality. But the sort of, the 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 other side of, of City's game that we saw here while they played this beautiful football and, you know, is kind of something that I feel like always goes under the radar whenever you talk about Manchester City is just how physical and aggressive they are. And I feel like this is a side of Villa that we don't necessarily have or haven't seen as much because due, due to the style of play, right, we like to dominate the play, sort of dictate the tempo ourselves. And I think ultimately City knew, I mean, City know that they can outplay Luton, but it kind of came down to when you play a team like Luton, one thing they've got is fight and you have to be able to outfight them as well and you sort of, you know, again, to to mention um, City's second goal, Haaland just sort of, you know, it's it's a long ball that's played up to him, get, sort of lays the ball off. He's just wrestling the centre half, and I think that's something that, you know, we, you know, in fairness, we do see Ollie Watkins do, and it's something that I think, you know, the midfield is going to have to be ready for that battle. Um, but I just think, you know, to win to win the game, you have to win the war, and to win the war, you have to outfight a team like Luton and it's going to be interesting how we approach this as the away side mate well I mean Haaland in that game was was just incredible I think he you know after the the Chelsea game at the Etihad and stuff like that people are kind of been asking questions but I mean in this game he was just incredible with the way that yeah he manages to kind of pin centre halves bring others into play before you can blink he's spun in behind and the kind of breadth to his game is just incredible. What it has given Villa is is a blueprint to kind of show that you you do have to be physical. If, if you go there and you're not up to the test, you they will and can exploit that. And I think Lucien have been really good at that. Like, I think what I've I've kind of liked is the discourse around Luton has really changed. That I don't think they're kind of recognised as this these brutes basically really that you know you go to kind of worth roads and you get bruised and they don't play very great football and because you know they're they're kind of goals for and against both sack up pretty well really and like compared to the size around them and compared to, you know they've only really scored one less goal this season than manchester united which if you compare the resources available to both clubs is it's pretty incredible they are and have show that they are a genuinely good footballing team that they can get the ball under the deck and obviously there is a lot about maximising the attributes of the players obviously they have a physical front two particularly they made the most of their set pieces and everything like that but you definitely can't ever sell Luton as a as a football team you really can't and I think there's been a lot of good storylines that have come out of it but yeah we we did 
the the home leg was an, was an interesting one, um, and I think it uh, it wasn't a it was a comfortable victory for us, and I think we have a lot of these games really as Villa fans where we see our team. As you say, it was not exactly a de- demolition job. We didn't blow them away. That's not to say that the scoreline flattered us, but we have a very interesting knack of taking the way, the game away from teams. And I think when you talk about control in possession and everything like that, I think there's two ways to be loose. And I think you, you kind of have to match them physically, but I think ultimately you probably have to take that side of the game away from them. You have to dominate the ball. You have to make sure that you don't give them a lot of opportunities to get bodies up the pitch, to get bodies into the box, to maximise on those set pieces and everything like that. I think if you can go there, take this thing out, Cameron Worth Road, pass the ball around, really stretch the pitch, allow them to make sure that they can't get compact and hit you on the counter attack, then I think that's the most effective way to kind of get around it. And I think that's what we did a really good job of Villa Park. Absolutely, mate. Absolutely. It's going to be probably easier to do that at home, isn't it? I think, you know, the the, the way that Luton set up um, it sort of does play into our hands. I always feel like we're going to do better against the side that sort of plays three at the back because there just tends to be that bit more space in the midfield uh, that they sort of have to compress that then obviously leads to space in behind. Uh, as long as we're patient and all goes to plan, mate. But I don't think we could talk about this game without talking about the Ross Barkley remontanda that's going on right now. And honestly... I'm surprised by this. I am surprised by this. A load of sort of, I think people have their sort of like edgy football takes and they're like, oh, you know, like Ross Barkley should be going to the Euros, this and that. And I don't like disagree with that. But a lot of the sort of narrative around it was like, Ross Barkley's always been this great player. And again, like to a certain extent, I don't disagree with that. But Ross Barkley only showed up for like five games for us, didn't he? So it's sort of, and then he's sort of, he's gone to Nice. It all sort of seemed to fall apart while he was, you know, in, in the south of France. And he's suddenly back at Luton now and all of a sudden in the limelight again. And, you know, he deserves all the credit he's getting, absolutely, because he has been phenomenal. I'm just sort of wondering where this came from. <laughs> like, again, because this is not the Russ Barkley that sort of laced up his boots for Aston Villa during the, the Kazoo title race, you know, during COVID for Villa, like... He's clearly in a much better headspace, isn't he? I, I think you really have to hand it to him. You really have to hand it to him. I think given that, you know, he's hit, let's be real, the, the lofty heights of football, playing for a number of Premier League teams, playing for England, a lot of caps for his national side. But for him to kind of go to Luton and really embrace that, really embrace his role within the team, and not see it as a kind of fault from grace, as you say, mate. See it as that comeback opportunity to be the main man again and to really reignite. And just remind everybody what our talent is. His talent was never in doubt. It was more the way that it was being applied that was the problem. And I, I really enjoy this story. I really do. I, I'm really happy for him, ultimately. I'm really happy for Luton because they would have taken a huge gamble on signing Ross Barkley. I imagine he's taken a hefty wage cut to go there, but still... I dare say he's probably the highest paid player in their history. And they've obviously taken a big old gamble on him. And it's really paid off. It's really paid off. And when you compare that to other clubs who took a punt, you know, you remember how much, I'm trying to think of similar storylines, someone like how much Nottingham Forest were reported to be playing Jesse Lingard yeah, on that one-year deal. And that didn't work out at all. And now you see all the, kind of financial and FFP trouble that Nottingham Forest are in. Luton couldn't really afford to get themselves into that situation. And I think it's it's really nice. It's really nice. It's great to see that he's embraced it. It's great to see that Luton have embraced him. I think they've got a really good blend in their side of staying true to the side and to this, the type of player that worked so well for them, that got them up well through the leagues. But they've added, I mean, that midfield kind of pairing of Ross Barkley and... Sambi Lakonga on loan from Arsenal has been really, really interesting. I think Alfie Dowd, he's had a great season on that left-hand side. Ted Mengi as well. I think there's there's definitely a lot of players that can hold their head up high and then they kind of play with this front three, front two. Um, Tate Chong has had a good season. Carlton Morris, has, I think, has shown that he can score goals at this level. Corley Woodrow has had to step it up front. It was probably not the, the best option that they have, but 
injuries have taken effects on Luton, just as they have with any other team, really. But yeah, I think that midfield pairing has done a really good job. And obviously, it's meant that Marvellous Nakamba is probably not as many minutes as maybe he'd have thought at the end of the season. I know he himself has kind of struggled with injury and stuff like that. But yeah, I have enjoyed the Spark Sparkly comeback, I have to say, mate. Is he on the plane? Not for me. Not for no. me. Uh, but I, 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 might, I think there's... He has played well, but I think you have to consider... I, I think in England are much better looking to the future. I think there's better options out there. But I, honestly, I think the fact that he's in that conversation, the fact that he is in that kind of all of players to go to the Euros, considering he's been playing for a relegation threat in Luton Town, is is pretty incredible in itself, to be honest with you. Oh, it's remarkable, mate. It's remarkable, the the levels that he's reaching. And hopefully, you know, for, for his and Luton's sake, he can maintain that. Just not on Saturday at 5.30, please, Ross. That would be greatly appreciated. I'd almost forgotten about Marv, because, yeah, you see, like, he's not really played all that many minutes. And um, Lukonga's Le- Le- an interesting one, because I feel like it's, you know, only the past sort of few months that, he, you know, he he seems to be sort of getting his career back on track as well. Like the the, the sort of the loan from Arsenal, I think it, you know it makes total sense for for him and Arsenal. He wasn't really getting game time. He's you know he he's he's not having to move too far away. He's a player that clearly has ability, and just sort of needed the platform to to, to flourish. And he is somebody that I I do worry about a little bit because he's all action, mate. He's everywhere. There's not a blade of grass that this man doesn't touch. You know, very physical player good range of passing he's exactly the kind of midfielder that I think can cause our midfield problems and I'm not saying he necessarily will but you know we've seen with guys like Cheek de Corre on occasion uh, you know guys who basically just cover every blade of grass really give us a bit of a hard time don't they <laughs> Yeah, but he's a very rangy midfielder. There's a lot of different kind of elements to his game. I think technically he's probably one up on Marv. Obviously, Marv's injuries, it's kind of, you're looking at it as touch and go whether he'll play again this season. And so, yeah, where exactly that does leave Marv kind of in the long run is ready to be seen. But yeah, as I said, it's a, it's a really nice midfield pairing between Samuel Lacombe and Ross Barkley. You've got pretty much everything that you need from a midfield pairing. You've got the kind of ball progressive abilities that both of them really shine in. Obviously, Ross Barkley is a bit of a bit more of a threat in terms of goal, but they both like to go both ways. Lukonga got an ability to cover more ground than you say than Ross Barkley, so he can kind of fit in behind and cover him when Barkley goes marauding forward. But yeah, both have got a really nice passing range. They're both very good on the ball. Both look good as well. And so, yeah, I think it's it has been really, really fun and it's shown that it's been really, really offensive. And I think in the world of kind of the sides around them when you consider that they're they're fighting in there with someone like Nottingham Forest who as I said have spent so much money since their return to the Premier League and are only what kind of four points better off at this season and Luton have got that game in hand I think when you look at the core of that team and how they're able to just add those little bits of quality to it it has it's really been impressive and I think Rob Edwards um, even if Luton aren't in the Premier League in a few years to come I dare say that Rob Edwards will be I think he's managed that really really nicely yeah, absolutely. Uh, a few people actually spotted him at Villa Park the other day as well. I'm um, obviously sort of scouting. Uh, I was out checking checking the team out. This is going to be a tough game for all the reasons that we've sort of just listed, mate. But I think we're capable of getting a win. I think it's going to be close. I'm going to go with a 1-0 win, mate. Nice. Nice. Yeah, I, I think that's the most important thing, mate. It's the three points. I think we'll come out of there. I think it will be close. Um, I'm going to take I think I'll take two one, please. Two one, yeah, respectable, mate, respectable. I think a, t- a two one is probably, it, yeah, that's that's given Luton probably what they will, what what they de- what they deserve almost. You know, we don't lose in London, do we? We don't. No, we don't. We've got a great record. I mean, do we count Luton as London? I'm going to count it for the purposes of this maintaining our record and giving myself optimism that Villa could go into the gap and get a win. I'm absolutely including London. Luton in <laughs> London, I should say. Well, they call it London Luton, don't they, the airport? So I guess we can uh, I guess we can allow them for that, mate. I guess we can allow them. But guys, you have to let us know your thoughts in the comment section down below. Um, the podcast isn't ending here, though, because we have a, you know, a tiny bit of a transfer of rumour mill sort of tack on to the end, a really interesting player that I think was worthy of talking about. 
and I guess this is probably you know this this debate could probably spark a whole other podcast episode to be honest mate if we sort of really went into the nitty gritty now I'm thinking about it but Ezekiel Palacios of Bayer Leverkusen is a player that has been linked to Aston Villa according to Sport Builds uh, Aston Villa are keen on signing by Leverkusen midfielder Ezekiel Palacios and are currently dealing with the Argentine, but will need to talk to the German side into the deal with any negotiations needing to start at 40 million euros. I feel like the idea of tapping up is just like non-existent now. All deals seem to be done with the player before they're done with the club. Absol- I, I'll never understand that myself. But I feel like we need, as football fans, we need clarity on that, on the sort of tapping up rule. But this, you know, there's, there's the, I think there's two trains of thought when you look at this, right? There is the, this is a really exciting, young, you know, sort of 25, yet to enter his prime midfielder, buying his trades at one of Europe's most exciting and informed teams right now in Bayer Leverkusen, absolutely running away with the Bundesliga, Argentine international, you know, regular sort of, goal and assist scorer getter in the Bundesliga as well played European football this season and you know when you see a fee like 40 million euros be banded about you sort of can't help but get excited and think yeah we're spending money we're getting a good player all of this kind of stuff and then I think the other train of thought is oh my goodness this is this is the Douglas Louise replacement mm-hmm. this is Douglas Louise leaving and, you know, it's kind of so that we've toyed with on a couple of podcasts and it's a debate that keeps sort of roaring on. If you had to sell somebody, which it looks like we do because we're in this sort of looks like £100 million FFP hole somehow, who do you sell? And I've slept on it many a time. And I think I've come to the conclusion that you cannot you cannot replace Ollie Watkins unless you go and get a Haaland and Osimhen, someone like that, which obviously is never going to happen. And again, I think we 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 spoke about that on the last podcast, didn't we, mate? I I think Douglas Louise is just as irreplaceable, but I think you can get close enough. Just not. I don't think you can get another Douglas, but I think you can get close enough. And I think Ezekiel Palacios is close enough. I, I think the the kind of school of thought that I'd go down is that you, when you kind of have these players, you don't try and replace them. You you can manipulate the system and try other profiles and everything like that. Because I think the more that you go down and you try and find a carbon copy of Douglas Louise, the more that you kind of you set yourself up to fail and I think in the way that obviously it took a lot of time but Leon Bailey I know we kind of we tried to dissipate Jack's influence on the team across the squad but Leon Bailey in terms of positional role is the guy that we brought in to replace Jack Grealish it was kind of announced in the aftermath of that deal I think this is the kind of the light that maybe you look at this deal and I think when you talk about this transfer it's very important to talk about those financial losses and everything like that mate uh, according to UEFA documents that came out last week I think uh, we announced a loss of 138 million euros it's been reported as pounds in a lot of places it's not as 138 million euros not that that changes a lot not that that makes it any better it is still one of the biggest losses recorded across any team in Europe We've got a lot of players who are on significantly high wages in the squad that we know that we've been trying to shift for some time. Luca Dean, namely Zaniolo, Longley, these guys alone who will be covering a significant portion of the wages for. We'll have also got some tough burdens in the squad. Someone like Diego Carlos, for example, who we signed, who wasn't able to pay for a lot of a long time. We had to bring in other players to kind of fill that place in the squad, which only added to his wages. And so you're kind of looking at the way that we've had to shift pillaging Bidais, the guys like Cameron Archer, other young players that are coming through. And it's looking more and more like those deals ultimately probably aren't going to prop up the books. And obviously I can hear everybody listening to this podcast and say, well, yeah, but look, we're about to kind of qualify for the Champions League and everything like that. 
I'm not an expert on those matters. You probably don't get paid for getting into the Champions League instantaneously. The wealth that you accrue from that competition is probably as a result of playing in it, as a result of sponsorship deals, as a result of TV deals. Getting your portion of the pie probably requires you to partake in the competition. And so depending on when the financial year falls, depending when we have to kind of stump up these funds, it's looking like the summer window could be an interesting one. And this is going to be a harsh reality, I think, for a lot of teams. But Villa have been spending pretty happily for some time now. And obviously, I know we keep citing the Jack Grealish deal as something that could balance the books, but that's a long time ago now. That's a long, long time ago. And whilst we will have inevitably split that fee up across a number of years, that probably, you know, it's very rare that you see. And I, I can say with almost certainty that City won't have paid 100 million up front in a lump sum. But at the same time, it would probably do another one. We're not a great selling club. This is something that we've said a long, for a long time that we have a pretty bad record of bringing players in and then being able to flip them for a profit. And no one in this Villa team is untouchable. And if any team comes in and puts anything close to £100 million on the line for any of our players, we should absolutely sell. We should absolutely sell. There is, you know, £100 million. You can't lose sight of what a, a kind of a, an astronomical fee that is. And so as much as I love half of these players and I never want to see them leave, if someone comes and puts that kind of money on the desk, you have to take it. And I think if you can then bring in someone like a Palacios for a portion of that fee, it pains me to say it. And I, th- I think it's so wrong, but it's probably as close to this business as you're going to get. It's hard to disagree, mate. It is hard to disagree. But, you know, first, just, you know, a bit more context for people who maybe aren't aware what Palacios is like. He, he is very similar to Douglas Louise, actually. He's very good at carrying the ball, a very good passer of the ball. He's averaging about 89 passes per game, puts him within the top two percentile of all midfielders in the world over the past year with an 89.6% pass completion rate. But again, you know, sort of like Douglas, he's deeper a lot of times. You know, he's averaging 3.2 tackles per 90 and 1.7 interceptions per 90 puts him within the top six percentile of midfielders over the past year uh in respect to both those stats and he's averaging 1.4 blocks as well and you know by Leverkusen have been the story of the 2023-24 season really if you haven't watched Shabby Alonso's by Leverkusen I recommend you, you do if you can because they have been sensational and we seem to do a lot of business with them anyway so there's clearly that relationship yeah. there. When you look at Leon Bailey, when you look at Moussa Diaby, we, we've, how many times have we sat here and talked about Jeremy Frimpong, mate? It's This is our feeder club. I think we may as well look at acquiring Bayer Leverkusen with V-Sports Group, um, if that's even possible, because they're obviously they're, they're owned by the pharmaceutical company, aren't they? Bayer. Um, but yeah, this is an interesting one, and I feel like it's an uncomfortable debate. And I I, I, I've seen a lot, not just in terms of like this, but like when it comes to the sort of the debate again, and this is the whole of the podcast, but moving away from Villa Park, people are very sort of closed off to to change and and I totally understand it. And I think, you know, the day we sell Douglas Louise is, you know, there, there will be a, a tear or two shed from my eye, no doubt. But is it for the greater good? Possibly. Well, yeah, because we can't really afford to be Definitely hit with not. fines and points deductions and whatever. So unless, you know, unless somebody wants to come and bid 200 million for Sinisalo or somebody, you know, who is expendable and that, you know, it's not just to put Sinisalo on the spot. Uh, but you know what I mean? Then I'm sure that would be welcomed. But I, I find it, I'm going to find it difficult to part ways with anyone in this squad, really. It's a really likeable really likable bunch in it mate yep no you're absolutely right mate you're absolutely right but yeah i mean we, you know it was devastating with losing jack but you know look, look where we are now you you kind of have to take the rough with this move and, and play the long-term game it was you know, losing jack was seen for a long time as the be all and end all that this club would fall apart and you know if you look at the two trajectories of each party since then um we're in a better place absolutely mate absolutely
that's a great note to end the podcast on. That is a great note to end the podcast on. Guys, let us know your score predictions in the comment section down below and your thoughts on Ezekiel Palacios as well. We'd love to know. Usually get a fair few Argentinians in, in, uh, listening to the podcast as well as a result to Emmy and stuff like that. So if you know if you guys know him from his time back in the homeland, let us know your thoughts. Uh, and yeah, like, comment, subscribe and up the villa.